Thank Hello? Yes. Okay, I'm going to stand very close to this microphone. I'm Sharon Fawcett, and I'm the Assistant Archivist for Presidential Libraries. I want to welcome all of you here today, students, docent, the press, staff. It's a pre we have today the preview of the Watergate Exhibit Gallery. Nearly four years ago, the Nixon Library was donated to the federal government by the Richard Nixon Library and Birthplace Foundation. We ask at that time that the foundation deed over to the government the political materials in the Nixon collections and on the Nixon tapes. The foundation deeded that material over on the, uh, on the day that, of the library transfer. We also asked that the Watergate exhibit be replaced, and the foundation asked Dr. Timothy Naftali to take on the task of redoing the Watergate exhibit. I want to express my thanks to the Nixon Foundation for asking us to take on this task and for their many thoughtful comments on the content of this exhibit. This is the National Archives Nixon Library Watergate exhibit curated by the library's director, Dr. Timothy Naftali. But it is an exhibit that has benefited from our interaction with the foundation following Tim's initial draft. I want to thank Tim for the extraordinary amount of research he undertook for this project and the innovative way in which the exhibit is presented, and you will all be seeing that shortly. I also want to thank the NARA Committee of Experts on Watergate and Exhibits, Nancy Smith, Steve Tilley, and Stacy Bredall for their advice and suggestions. David Painter of the National Archives staff also contributed through his research and fact-checking. The current staff of the Nixon Library and former staff in College Park worked diligently for decades to open the vast trove of records on which this exhibit is based. We look at this exhibit as being built on the work of two generations of archivists. Using the documentary record, we have chosen to highlight specific events, conversations, and reflections on the original Watergate timeline. The original Watergate exhibit that was in this library is in itself a record of President Nixon's own view on Watergate. And the Nixon Foundation has put online on its website the original script with the handwritten notes of Richard Nixon on the text. We welcome this as a great addition to the historical record reflecting President Nixon's own thoughts. It's also complementary to the original exhibit pictures and text that appear on NARA's website starting today. You will find in this exhibit opening excerpts from the Frost-Nixon interview with Nixon. You'll see uh, Nixon's own reflections in his memoirs. And combined with the original Watergate exhibit, these reflect the three times President Nixon commented publicly about Watergate after his resignation. Every president has faced controversy, and many have looked to their predecessors for how to govern and how to record the history of their administrations. President Nixon was no different. President Johnson filled him in on the taping system shortly before Nixon took office. President Nixon refined this system and maintained it um, to keep a record of his conversations. As the presidents before him, President Nixon thought these conversations would be only for his own personal use. Wiretapping for national security purposes was not then illegal, and dirty tricks, though wrong and unethical, had long been a part of American electoral politics. Just ask any historian. Did President Nixon go further than other American presidents? How did the turmoil of the 60s and early 70s surrounding the Vietnam War impact the president's actions? Did President Nixon know about the break-in in the Democratic headquarters in the Watergate Hotel? What role did Congress, the Supreme Court, and the media play in the controversy, and how did these actions impact President Nixon? Did Watergate change how we look at the use of presidential power? These are questions that we look at in this exhibit today and we ask you to think about. The National Archives assumed responsibility for presidential libraries in 1941 when we accepted the Roosevelt Library. Seventy years later, we have experienced the evolution of many presidential exhibits. Today, the Roosevelt Library openly discusses the controversies surrounding America and President Roosevelt's response to the Holocaust. Today, the Hoover Library looks seriously at the reasons that Hoover failed in leading America at the onset of the Great Depression. Today, the Reagan Library exhibit includes the Iran-Contra controversy that nearly derailed the Reagan presidency. And today, 
The Nixon Library provides a detailed timeline and a thematic exhibit on the scandal that became known as Watergate. In each of these presidential libraries and others, the exhibits have benefited from the extensive work of archivists opening the papers of and the records of these men who have served in the nation's highest office. And in each of these libraries, we explore the complete life and legacy of these men who have been president and what we can learn from them, as President Roosevelt remarked at the opening of his library, to gain in judgment for the creation of the future. And now, it is my distinct honor to introduce David Ferriero, the Archives of the United States. He has been enormously helpful and supportive of this major exhibit, including ensuring that funds were available to support the installation. David began his career as a shelver at the MIT library and rose to direct that library. He went on to direct the library at Duke University and to head up special libraries at the New York Public Library. His interest in presidents began very early in his life. The presidential library directors at Kennedy, Eisenhower, and Johnson have uncovered in their extensive archives letters he wrote as a young man to their presidents. So it is quite fitting that David could be with us today to open this important new NARA exhibit. Ladies and gentlemen, my boss, the 10th Archivist of the United States, David Perry. Thank you, Sharon. Uh, it is true that I've written four letters. I have no memory of writing any one of them, but sure enough, they are in my hand. It's a pleasure to welcome you here to the Nixon Library as we open the new Watergate exhibit. A test of a nation's commitment to transparency and self-government comes in how it explains to succeeding generations the more difficult or controversial moments of its past. I'm very proud of how the National Archives in general and the Nixon Library in particular has met that challenge in creating a Watergate gallery in Yorba Linda. History, however far it may seem to some, is often personal. I'm grateful to the Richard Nixon Foundation, which consulted with us for its seriousness of purpose and professionalism in what I know was a difficult endeavor. I'm grateful to the National Archive professionals in Washington, especially Sharon Fawcett and the Watergate Review Panel, and to the team at the library who contributed to this work. And I would like to thank Library Director Tim Naftali, a distinguished historian in his own right, who led the effort and whose research and vision shaped this exhibit. In July 2007, the Nixon Library became part of the Federal Presidential Library System, and the Nixon Foundation joined our circle of foundation partners who have built and supported the 13 presidential libraries. The library arguably holds the fullest record of any presidential administration in history. Visitors to this beautiful site also have the privilege of witnessing the full circle of President Nixon's life, from the house where he was born in 1913 to his and Mrs. Nixon's final resting place. In February, we moved the last of Richard Nixon's presidential records from College Park, Maryland, to this library to join the records of President Nixon's early years in his role as a senior statesman. The Nixon collection is now whole and under the supervision of an excellent staff of federal archivists. Over the past four, four years, this staff here and in College Park has released nearly a million pages of documents and hundreds of hours of White House tapes, a, a testament to the commitment of National Archives professionals everywhere to open and accessible records. Though the Watergate scandal may have ended President Nixon's presidency, other galleries in this library show the significant changes he made in the nation's social, political, and economic structure, along with historic breakthroughs in foreign affairs with the Chinese and the Soviets and in the Mideast. Over the next few years, we plan to update many of these galleries to reflect changes in museum technology and the release of new information. Planning has already started on a future gallery that will explore in detail his role as a senior statesman and advisor to presidents in the dramatic years at the end of the Cold War. I'll now turn you over to Tim Naftali, director of the Nixon Library and curator of this new exhibit. Tim, as you heard, joined the National Archives in 2006, and before that, he taught history at several universities, including the University of Virginia, 
where he served as director of the Presidential Recordings Program at the Miller Center for, of Public Affairs. He was also a consultant to the Nazi war crimes and Japanese imperial government records interagency working group at the National Archives and is a prolific writer for both popular and scholarly audiences. Ladies and gentlemen, Tim Nottali. Thank you, David. Can you, can you hear me? Thank you. Thank you, David. Like your predecessors, Dr. Alan Weinstein and Adrian Thomas, you only asked me to do my very best and were prepared, whatever the external pressures, to let the historical chips fall where they may. For that, future visitors to this museum <clears throat> will be forever in your debt. I should like to thank Sharon Fawcett also, under whose leadership a number of presidential libraries have started taking intellectual ownership of their museums, instead of merely dusting exhibits written by others. The public deserves nonpartisan, objective, presidential library museums for their money. I also wish to recognize at this point the contribution of the Reverend John Taylor. In 2006, as executive director of the Nixon Foundation, he joined Alan Weinstein in asking me to do a new Watergate gallery when I was hired. John understood that a public museum could not have a polemical exhibit on a national constitutional crisis, however painful that change would be for friends and associates of President Nixon, the man at the center of it all. Although John and I disagreed on some matters, we had mutual respect, and in the years since John left the foundation have become friends. Knowing that an intellectual advocate of the president like John would review my work made me better at my job and made this exhibit ultimately more comprehensive. <laughs> I did this sort of thing before Speaker Boehner. Uh, <laughs> and I'd, I'd like to thank my mother. <laughs> And uh, my late father, who I assume is playing golf today with Dwight Eisenhower and John F. Kennedy, <laughs> not for inspiring me to write about wrongdoing, but for instilling in me a belief in the importance of telling the truth, whatever the consequences. But making this exhibit was not the story of one person. It couldn't be. Given its intrinsic importance and our ambitious vision, it had to draw upon many talents. The goal of the exhibit was to create what we might call now iPad history, a totally interactive, comprehensive collection of information about the Watergate scandal, including incidences of governmental abuses of power. And there were three good reasons for doing that. One, the central objective of this museum is civic literacy, and our main client is the 14-year-old visitor who is texting while you are telling them about people not, not only their grandparents' age, great-grandparents' age, but from a different era and culture. How do you get their attention and hold it long enough so that they see that Watergate teaches some important truths about their rights as citizens, about the power of the U.S. Constitution, and about the limits on the power of their own government? Second reason. The Nixon Presidential Collection is arguably the richest of any presidential library thanks to the tapes and a president who preferred to read memos than see advisors. Presidential libraries contain archives and museums. The credibility of one affects the other. How could people believe that our archivists were providing unfettered access to documents if our museum were viewed as biased? Similarly, how could visitors believe the stories of President Nixon's successes in building Dictant, in opening the door to China, and in producing some of the most progressive domestic policy of the second half of the 20th century if those galleries were attached to an incomplete, inaccurate, and whitewashed Watergate gallery. Three, Watergate itself is complex and involved many people from three branches of government, some partisan, some not. Their story is not preserved in any public museum in the United States. The only crisis to have resulted in the resignation of a president, Watergate has an enduring lessons. We needed one. 
And given that technology has erased the brick and mortar footprint of the classic museum, we could do it and make it transportable via the web. Imagine, we can now say that this shows our self-confidence as a people. How more self-confident do you have to be to be able to say that we have a government that is so committed to transparency and democracy that it's going to put in a museum that thousands and thousands of people can see evidence of its own wrongdoing. Imagine, not only do we have something that you can visit today, but we have digital archives, which can be put on the web. So if others from other countries ever ask us, to what extent are we committed to those values of freedom and democracy that we talk about all the time, all you have to say is, let them come to your Belinda. Let them visit the Nixon Library website. That shows you our country's commitment to openness and to honesty about moments in our history that were not always the best. But uh, this is a big undertaking. And right now, I want to introduce you to the professionals who made what you are about to see possible. I would like to ask, as I, as I mentioned your names, uh, my colleagues to come in front and stand here. Uh, first of all, this archive, uh, today we are opening the most comprehensive archive of oral histories on abuses of governmental power and a constitutional crisis ever. We are uh, opening 750 segments, which totals about 40 hours of content on an archival interactive. Uh, when this project started, <clears throat> we uh, weren't sure how much money we would have, and we did ultimately benefit from money we raised here and money that uh, Washington was able to provide us. But in the beginning, we had to be entrepreneurial. And, uh, and so I want to start by, uh, by thanking my, my colleague, um, Eric Christman, and I would sit in the back there in that room and edit video. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm afraid we're going to lose Eric someday to Hollywood because Eric has become <laughs> proficient in uh, making documentaries. Uh, the film clips that you see today, Eric cut, uh, and he has done many other things, but without Eric Christman, there would, wouldn't be the ability to, to pr provide you with all these oral histories that we did. He created the portal, and he deserves enormous praise, and I could not have done this exhibit, given the importance of the oral histories without Eric. So Eric, would you please come up and stand here? <laughs> joys of this job is that you can release documents. And uh, we actually have a special uh, responsibility, it's delegated to me, but it's actually David's, <clears throat> to release documents regarding abuses of governmental power. It's part of the central charter of the Nixon Library. Um, uh, as part of the effort to provide you as comprehensive a Watergate exhibit as possible, we uh, undertook a, a thorough survey of our vaults. And I want to thank uh, Marty McGann, who, who has moved on to uh, better things, working for Sharon. Uh, but uh, the archivists who worked with Marty, and we established a special review team that ultimately released about 35,000 pages, not all of which were Watergate related, but many of them touched on Watergate. And they're all, to some extent, reflected in this exhibit. So to some extent, even for Watergate scholars, there are a few new things in this exhibit. Uh, these materials are open to the public. We put them on the web, actually, before we use them in an exhibit. Uh, we provided them um, for others to see, but we wanted to make them part of our public history. And, and uh, I, I would like Jason Schultz and Melissa Hedden, if they're in the back. Um, are there anybody? Some of they are. We are running. Oh, there's Melissa and Jason. You would come down. Uh, as, as junior archivists, one of their first tasks. Uh, was to work on this uh, review panel under the uh, tutelage of uh, Marty and others. Uh, uh, I would, uh, now reviewing materials, documents, is not just what we do. We have to review the oral histories. And uh, 
just today, to celebrate our, the opening of the exhibit, we're opening seven new oral histories, including oral histories with Alexander Butterfield and Bob Woodward. And I'd like to ask Megan, Megan Lee, if you're here, come down. Um, under the guidance of, of Greg Cumming, we have a, a superb team of archivists who do lots of things all the time and help those in front of you. And I would like Greg and all the other members of our archival team to please come and stand in front of us. They are responsible for those million pages. When, uh, when, when Sharon Fawcett and John Taylor negotiated the joint operating agreement that made uh, this library, the presidential library possible, John showed uh, foresight and commitment to in openness by letting us uh, review materials we didn't own yet so that they could be released on the day of our opening. And uh, Greg, and Ira, uh, you were here, there, you guys, and Megan deserve enormous credit for what you did in 2007 so that everybody could have access to the material then, and we benefited from that, too. Um, I wanted to I also mention Ryan Pettigrew. Ryan is our AV archivist. There are a number of, a lot of films. Uh, there's a, another man named Steve Green who was doing it for us in, in Washington. Um, Ryan is the inheritor of Steve Green's work and someone who's uh, improved on it or expanded it. Uh, but this isn't just about documents and oral histories. We also felt it necessary to review every Nixon tape from the summer of 1971 and the summer of 1972 to ensure that in this, uh, in this archive here, in this museum, you would be hearing the evolution of the reaction to the Pentagon Papers leak and the evolution of the cover-up and the role of the president in it. And so I want to ask Bill, where's Bill? Bill Cowell, there you go. Bill Cowell, from, who's from our Washington Nixon Tapes team, who worked so hard with me and provided a fantastic <laughs> segment. Before coming to the archives 20 years ago, Bill was a sergeant major. Uh, so I, I knew that things would get done <laughs> and that I would do it on time. <laughs> um, besides the, uh, besides the, the content, uh, we did, in the early days, produce some temporary exhibits. And some of the, the thinking behind those exhibits found their way into what you're going to see today. And I just want Olivia Anastasiadis, please, to come down. And I want Equan Kim and Christine Mickey, if they're to come down, please provide it. Now there's 700 segments uh, in in the huge interactive, and they needed metadata, and, and a number of generations of interns helped us with the metadata. Uh, and uh, initially they were uh, overseen by Paul Musgrave, who's gone on to bigger and better things. But uh, today we have a marvelous education specialist, Mindy Farmer, who uh, has read every draft of this exhibit and been a confidant and has supervised a wonderful team of interns to help us finish the job. Mindy is probably running around doing something. Oh, you're here? Oh, there. Come on, Mindy. <laughs> Mike Ponsewitz and Samaya Ilyas are there. If they could come down for having provided extra eyes for the proofing. And I'd like to ask all the interns who are here who've helped in school tours or otherwise helped us also to come to the front. There is sometimes a question about what, you, what your public servants do for you. Look at these faces young and youthful. <laughs> These are the best public servants you could have. And anybody who comes to this library ought to know that we have the finest professional team. We are proud of them. I am proud to serve them. 
They make me happy. Uh, and, and I just want you to give them a long, big round of applause for their Watergate exhibit. to thank uh, you can have great content and you can have a vision but some somehow you still need some some help to, to, to make it come and to realize it and I have had the benefit of learning on the job with some of the finest museum tech, uh, professionals in the United States and so I'd like to thank John Kyoto on behalf who represents Gallagher today I think he, it's not for me to say but I think you'll find their design brilliant I want to thank Peter Loading on behalf of Bobus for uh, pulling, pulling things together, making sure it happened. Uh, if Betty Steining's here, I'd like to thank him for the work done by Lexington. Uh, you're going to see some absolutely incredible uh, interactives, and Mike Boudet of G2, and uh, the folks at Moe who put everything in, they deserve credit for that, and so too does IDI that did our big interactive in, in Virginia. As I said, this is not one man's story. This is a wonderful group of professionals all pulling together to make something happen. Watergate was the ultimate stress test for our institutions back then and for this one now. One of the lessons for visitors is how resilient our democratic institutions proved to be. In these partisan times, among the few things that we Americans tend to agree on, whether of the left or the right, is the danger posed by unchecked governmental power. Whether concerns are of energetic public policy, of warrantless snooping, or of an aggressive IRS, Americans agree about the basic wisdom of a government of three equal parts which keep each other in some check. Watergate is the story of the self-correcting mechanism of our Constitution when one of the branches exceeds its authority. It is equally the story of how individuals, when faced with a powerful and adversarial government, can receive constitutional protection. And finally, Watergate is not just a story of lies, crimes, and abuses. It is equally the story of many Americans, men and women, trying to do the right thing for their country, hear their stories, see their dilemmas, see how they manage. Frankly, one Watergate was enough. And listening to their stories and reading about them may help ensure that future generations, not just here, but wherever these materials are viewed, will not have to experience a similar political crisis. Now, it is up to you to judge whether we realized our hopes in this exhibit. Thank you very much for coming today.